I began to realize my talent, non-educational, not life, but this other realm started to bleed in. And I could see things before they occurred. Welcome, Nan, to the studio. Amr, thank you. Um, you're the principal of Creative Life Sciences. That's correct. And uh, we've known each other for 15, probably more years. More now. years, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm very excited to have you. Thank you. Um, uh, you were the beginning of a journey for me. Um, you knew my wife. Yes, I did. Um, some of the stuff that we saw or the things that I'd seen that you'd shown us or shown me was pretty miraculous. Thank um, you. So you do your mastery in energy. Is yes. That where you would that's one of the ways of thinking about it. So there is a field that's beyond the body. And we can control our bodies by, mm, I don't know, exercise, eating right. Uh, but there's this other component that we don't know how to control. And that's where my expertise lies. So when you got into this, and let, let's let's go back a little. So this, you're going to auras, we go into mediumship, we go into energy. Where, where, where were you born? Yeah, wow. I was born in India. <laughs> <laughs> long time and long ago. <laughs> so, so when you were in India, like, uh, how was it growing up? What was life like? Yeah, so I didn't grow up in India. Okay. I grew up in Hong Kong. Okay. So Hong Kong was an interesting... Uh, meeting of different philosophies. Uh, so you had the Confucian Taoism mindset, and then you had the Hindu Buddhic mindset. So all the four merged. And from that, I took away what essentially is the kind of work that I do today. And so those four philosophies um, basically talk about the same thing, but in a, from a different angle or a different point of view. Correct. And for the common person to read about it may take generations. Right? <laughs> so how do we distill it down to a simple, here it is, cliff notes kind of thing? <laughs> what, what, what age is this first? Like what age were you in Hong Kong when this yeah. began? Uh, so this began when I was um, probably in the mid 60s. Okay. Yeah, uh, mid to early 60s, 63, 64. So you're around 24, 20. Actually, I was younger. Oh, you're younger? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not that old. I, I'm not good at math. <laughs> right, right, right. So this would have been in my early teens. Okay. And so if you follow the British system, it was a primary school function. Okay. And here in this country, they call it a junior high kind of level, okay. uh, elementary going into a junior high. And it was interesting because there were, there were nuances in both the culture, the languages, uh, and then at that time, Hong Kong was a British Crown calling, so you had yet another layer of something yeah. that was added to the mix. And most people, I found, uh, fell into a space where they all could communicate, regardless of religion or background. And it was a very open society, uh, although it had its you know extremes, as all societies do. But generally speaking, it was very um, accepting word I would use. And that allowed the freedom to really expand and look at the world that I'm in today right. and embrace it. And uh, so so it was just a pleasant journey from that point forward. So, so being in Hong Kong growing up, um, when did you decide to come to America? Or did you go to come to America first or did you travel to other places before coming to America? Yeah, actually it was just about education. So it was the next level of education. So oh. there are there are universities in Hong Kong, but there, there are only f four of them, I think, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and the waiting list was very, very long, and you had to be really superior to get into them. W what were you trying to study? Like, when you, w what was your intention back then of what you yeah. thought you were going to go for? Right. So um, my intention was to do commerce and business, because if you, if you understood Hong Kong back in the 60s, it was a booming environment of... Uh, manufacturing, uh, shipping, it was the portal to China. Correct. So goods would be made in China and then they would be brought here to Hong Kong and from Hong Kong they'd be then shipped out. And so uh, Hong Kong created its own and I think 
one of the best seaports at that time. Since then, of course, there have been others, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I do recall a lot of container ships coming and going. And in those days, they didn't have containers. So okay. it was everything was packed up on pallets and hauled onto ships. Just on the ships <laughs> until it fell off in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there must be some interesting treasure <laughs> between here and there. <laughs> so that, that uh, led me to really look at commerce. And Hong Kong was a very vibrant um, space for being uh, able to get into the world of business and understand it from different points of view. Uh, so, and uh, it was just a natural step to go into right. a business program. So, so you come to America, and what do you start doing when when you when you arrive? Yeah, studying. So, so, so just education. You're in school. Yep. I'm in school, I'm studying. Um, the, the trick was, before coming here, I began to realize my talent. Uh, Non-educational, not life, but this other realm started to bleed in. And I could see things before they occurred. Okay. And so it was, uh, it was an interesting journey because when I was applying for colleges, I only applied for one. And I applied for that particular one because I knew I'd get in. It was very difficult to get in at the time in that university. Uh, while my classmates were applying to six or seven or eight different universities at the same time. Um, so the first thought was to come out here and I could, I could almost see the steps of me coming out here. So this is your intuition yes. taking its shape yes. before you're recognizing it and you're saying, hmm, this interest is something happening. Yeah. And so you're, you're just following it through, right? I'm just following it through because of the of the environment that I grew in. Nobody said, hey, you can't do that. Yeah. So it was doable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah. So it would be interesting to, to sort of fly out here because there were times when uh, there was one particular time when we had a wide-body jet that I was on and two of the three engines failed. Wow. Yeah. And so there was panic. And I thought, yeah, we'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, we so I was one that would have been the ones screaming in the back. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Land the plane. Land the plane, but we were over the ocean. Uh, so they did finally find an airport in the middle of the night in some country, and we landed. And, and all I remember was, why aren't we on the plane? Because the seats here are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Let's get back and you know, lie down and go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. So you, you're in school, you're studying, mm -hmm. and now you're going into business. So do you actually end up... You, you get your degree and you, do you actually use that in your career? Like, do you I start do. your career? I do. And um, what, do you, what did you start doing? Yeah, so there are a couple of things that I started doing. First, uh, I, I tried to do an import-export company. Okay. And uh, that uh, didn't go well because that was my first foray. And I was trying to follow the outlines that I'd learned in college and there was everything wrong. Got it. Right? So your intuition tells you do this, but the numbers say do that. and. The two don't mix, God, God. <laughs> as you start out, at least. Uh, so I, I stopped doing that, and then I got into real estate. Got it. And real estate was a good environment to step into, uh, at least for me, because I understood how the numbers worked, okay. and I understood how to understand what would sell and what wouldn't sell. Got it. So we would we would uh, you know look at a piece of land and I could imagine the kind of building that would be on it and I would go and find a developer and I'd say hey why don't you build this kind of building on it and I know who's going to be a tenant because I could see who would be the tenant yeah. and so that started uh, an interesting component of life. Not everything was successful, but the learning curve was relatively shorter than I recall. Got it. Most people haven't gone through that. So, so you're in commercial real estate. Then, right? That's correct. And, and so this thing starts developing, and it's it's becoming successful. Yes. Uh, and now, how do you take it to the next level? Like, where do you start? Do, do you continue doing it? Do you leave it? Like, yeah. wh where's the next step for you? I, I think it's like driving a car or riding a bicycle. You never forget how to do something. Yeah. Uh, but I very quickly learned... Uh, that people were getting into real estate for different reasons other than an investment or to build the future. They had no uh, program other than just how much money can I make off of this. Okay. And the more I got into that, the more I saw that, the more I realized I didn't like that. And uh, 
I knew how to fix things. Uh, by fixing, I mean, you know, finding a piece of land, connecting with a developer and having a building built. I could fix things. And I could perceive things at the back end and the front end. Um, so I decided one day to just walk away from real estate. Literally, just mm. unannounced, just stepped up, walked away. <laughs> well, and this is now because the, what your intention was, right? So yes. the intention of what other people you're seeing and your yeah. intention was very different. And you just... It, it, it didn't harmonize. Yeah. And I thought there's got to be another way to really do what I'm here to do. And so a lot of people ask about their journey. Yeah. Right? And so I fumbled into my journey. Yeah. And... Uh, I was uh, lucky enough that I was in a space that I could do that. Uh, life literally changed overnight. Um, what seemed to be a challenge uh, became a greater challenge, but only momentarily, and all of a sudden became a non-challenge. Yeah. And it was almost like uh, walking with a high wind coming at you, and every step was really difficult to take. Yeah. All of a sudden, the wind's behind you, and all of a sudden, it's pushing you. Yeah. So. Why fight it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so your first step into this now. Mm-hmm. So you you walk away. You say, "What am I doing with myself?" Or you yeah. say, "I'm I'm starting this. I'm going to start teaching. I'm going to start showing people. Right. I'm going to start helping people." Yeah. And do you just so do you? What do you do? You just start telling people you're doing. You just start creating people. Where, yeah. where does it? How how does it come to today? Is yeah. is, is that the what you're asking? Well, uh, I think one of the things that most of us don't do is we don't listen to ourselves. And for about, I want to say, a good um, four to six months uh, after I walked away from the real estate uh, end of it, I found myself really doing some really deep thinking. And if you saw me, you'd say I'd be in a state of meditation. And I began to talk to myself. Uh, as though I was lecturing me and and yet receiving the lecture on yeah. both both parts, um, and I began to hear what the direction was, and uh, I would I would uh, uh, begin to understand without ever being taught uh, how to look in the future, how to you know talk to those that had passed on, how to fix someone's imbalance as. We can't say healing, at least in this country, but how to balance out the energies of an individual. And uh, most of my peers didn't have a business background, okay. and I did. And I thought, mm, well, if you're going to manufacture something, you got to have a system. Yeah. And I began to create a system around it, and and tweaked it, and tweaked it, and tweaked it until what into what it is today. Which is your own modality, right? My own modality. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so now when you're trying this let's just just say on someone who's come to you and you're you're beginning this so are you testing it on the other people now are you just trial and error saying "Hmm, i'm feeling this yeah this is right i feel the energy i has this change has this movement this is a very early 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 so are you feeling it happened like are you feeling the changes in people when you're balancing or showing energy are you waiting for the feedback yeah almost immediately you see a shift in the in the person receiving that whatever that is um and pretty soon there's a pattern that shows up and if you can recognize the pattern then you can systemize it and if you can systemize it you can recreate it yeah and so it was a it was a space where uh, feedback was presented work was done and um it began it began with just what i thought Physically, I could do, uh, you know, like a like a track and field star would maybe run a distance and then and and then get a gold medal or whatever the focus was. Uh, but I thought that couldn't be the only race. There's got to be other races. So I looked this way, and there's someone doing a long jump, and I looked that way. Someone's throwing a shot put, and I go like, well, why can't we combine all yeah. of that into one race? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I began triathlete. To, they call it. Yes. <laughs> Or multi-athlete, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I began to uh, understand how to put this together, uh, and it was it was not easy. Uh, I had some good guidance. Uh, I could bounce uh, some of the stuff off uh, my friends who were in the medical field. Okay. So I would say, "Hey, I'm I'm seeing this inside of a person. What am I seeing?" 
And they would say, oh, you're probably seeing this or that. And I go, well, I, if I can manipulate it, what would happen? And, oh, yeah, you'd get this result. And so I began to manipulate it, and the result would show up. So there was different kinds of feedbacks. So, so you're seeing the, the medical condition inside yes. someone. Yes. You, you didn't understand the, the biology yes. at that moment. That's correct. And, and so now when you're going back and forth, then you're trying to figure, okay, well, this is what it is, and how do I change it? And that's really what you're working towards, or we're correct. working towards. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, on one track, one of the you know, various components of this yeah. race that we were in. Uh, so then I thought, can we replicate it? Let's put a class together. And it was funny because my first class was um, rather random. Yeah. Uh, I announced it on a Friday afternoon, and Saturday morning I was teaching. I didn't have a curriculum. Uh, Saturday morning over breakfast, uh, in fact, the napkin that was at the breakfast table, I looked at it, and I jotted about three lines on <laughs> it, and it turned out to an eight-hour class. So wow. I thought, oh, okay, wow. I, I know how to do this. <laughs> now I just got to remember and put it into, into yeah. paper, which I did subsequently over the years. Yeah. So when does meditation come into this now? Like, you know, a lot of people try to meditate. A lot of people do it in different ways. Um, where does it come into... The first thing, what, 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 how does it come into you, and then we'll go back into right. what, what is the right modality? So... Um, I look at meditation in a very, very, very different way. Uh, most people think it is uh, sitting in a certain position, um, repeating a certain phrase or a mantra. Uh, and I thought, yeah, who has the time to do that? And how practical is that? You can't just, you know, in a, in a work day, uh, if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's, say, excuse me, i got to take 45 minutes off, and I'm going to sit there in this position and do nothing. <laughs> That's... That doesn't sort of comport with what the environment is at yeah. the time. Um, so I looked at meditation and I began to understand that there are various different kinds of meditations or how to achieve meditation. And then I began to understand uh, what is the purpose of meditation and how to get into that space we call meditation or that zone. Yeah. And uh, I, I came to the conclusion that Really, meditation is the art of talking to your higher self. And the, the more you practice, the more you can communicate with your higher self. Because my position is that the higher self knows the game plan. And we're you know, on the field not knowing you know, where the goalie is or whoever is. We just see our position. Yeah. And our higher self sort of sees the entire field. Yeah. And so when you have a chance to chit-chat with, your higher self, literally it's a chit chat, it's a very casual conversation. Um, you, begin to, you begin to understand the field and the players on the field and how the team is made up and what's the focus of the team. And, yeah. and then you bring that information back and you execute that information, and you put it into production. So to me, meditation is a space where you actually get information uh, that can be achieved with just sitting in a space. Uh, if you want to repeat a phrase, great. If you don't want to, great. You can lie down. You can be snoring. It doesn't make a difference yeah. as long as that information comes through. Is, is there a similarity? Like, let's just say people are going to a church to pray or people are in the forest and they're walking and they're by themselves. Is that a similar journey? I, yeah, of meditation where, so. where information flows? I think so. I'm not very familiar with uh, other cultures, but I would I would say that that would be the same um, concept. Yeah. So you go to a space where you're not interfered with, yeah. and you get that information. You come back a very different individual. Right. So we've evolved, so to say. So uh, I mean, we, we've done group meditations together, we which have. are pretty miraculous by themselves <laughs> <laughs> and fun. <laughs> so so um, like when we do uh, the group meditation, and this is something which I thought was pretty amazing, was. Um, the, the temperature change. Yes. Uh, it's like you walk into a freezer and you come out, literally, I see you with a big jacket on going to this <laughs> meditation and I'm saying, did he just come out of a freezer? <laughs> I, I'm literally thinking this. Yeah. And then when I'm meditating, I feel the, the cold air and the little baseball cap feeling on your head and your yes. third eye. And um, like, how does that, like, wh what is that? Right, so um, to be able to communicate with you or your higher you, uh, certain conditions have to be met, and one of the conditions is to get into the zone. The zone always has very low temperature, regardless of what the ambient temperature is around the space. And it is in that zone 
with that temperature that you begin to connect with your higher self. And your higher self connects, uh, the, the point of connection are really two. Uh, one is what is commonly known as the third eye, which most people think is here, but I think it's like this entire space because okay. uh, you can feel tingling, zipping back and forth, yes. up and down. Uh, and then the other uh, connection point is the back of the head. Got it. So if you look at, uh, you know, just general drawings or philosophies, they'll say something about chakras, and you can connect chakra systems with where you're getting the information from. So, uh, so another thing I found fascinating was about the the meditation. So, how, how long are you meditating every day? I mean, how how much do you, how much meditation do today? you today? Oh. Somewhere north of five, short of six hours a day. So, like, even when we've been in meditation and people are feeling and seeing the same thing, yeah. which I think is miraculous by itself, like everybody is seeing whether it's a cube spinning in the middle of the room or someone standing there. Right. So, uh, so the, the connection of everybody as a group meditation, how does the group meditation play a part versus the individual meditation? Right. So we're, we're actually talking about a separate concept, and it's called collective consciousness. So what collective consciousness is, uh, very simply and very humbly, is a journey with a group of people. So we're all going to go camping. And, you know, your backpack might be heavier and that person's backpack might be lighter and you might be uh, having insect repellent on you and the other person may not have. But they will look at that uh, journey very differently, but it's the same journey. Got it. And you're going to look at that journey very differently because, you know, you've got your backpack and you've got your yeah. uh, bug spray and all of that. So the experience that you get is very different. Um, there was one meditation we did. There were about uh, 27 of us. Uh, and yes, the temperature did drop. And I mean, it's like freezing. And, and this is us putting blankets. You hand out blankets as they're I walking do, through the I door. Do. Emergency <laughs> kits. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. You know, you know that well. Yeah. Um, one meditation we had where I started off with a, a very brief guided component. I, and I just said, hey, we're at the edge of a forest. And I see something in the forest. Let's go explore. Yeah. And uh, uh, when we came back out, we had a group discussion. And one person said, oh, did you see the ruins in the forest? And I go, ruins? Oh, yeah, I saw the ruins. Did you see the monkeys dangling from the trees? And everybody saw bits and pieces of other people's collective consciousness component of the meditation. Okay. And everybody got connected. Uh, it, it was wonderful because uh, one person said, yeah, did you see the uh, pond? And one said, that was a pond. It looked bigger to me than a pond. The other one said, yeah, and I went swimming in it. So you were skinny dipping in that? <laughs> so, you know, we had, we had good conversation, yeah. fun conversation. But again, it was all in the central place. And I think that's called collective consciousness. So the, the meditation state takes you to a higher vibration. That's correct. And this is when, obviously, the sensations start, the mm -hmm. tingling of the head, mm -hmm. the air blowing around, which mm -hmm. are very subtle to some people. Because you remember, like, you're very subtle. Like, is it the AC on? And you're checking the AC, <laughs> you're turning, turning on and off. <laughs> right. And then you just check. Because I even bought a thing to measure my temperature. So I have an electronic, right? it measures your body temperature and it measures uh -huh. the temperature just to see if... Am I really seeing it? Because you, your mind just doesn't want you to believe it, but it wants you to believe it, and you're questioning yourself. Right. So, so, so the the meditation raises your vibration. It does. So, as you raise the vibration, other um, gifts or attributes start turning on. Yes. Uh, so this could be like um, uh, the auras. Yes. Uh, so where does the aura play a part of this? Right. So. Um I think the aura, uh, and there are various auras, by itself is a great study. And so we have uh, the aura, and the simplest way of understanding an aura without really pegging it or defining it is it's a shadow or a mirror image of you, yeah. but a version of you. Got it. Right? And so uh, auras can be uh, as big as you or as small as they, can, they need to be. Auras can be different layers, uh, and each layer might have a different color. Yeah. And each uh, layer, along with a different color, might have a different sense of vibration or coldness, uh, which means it contains very different information. And so 
if I were to study someone and if I was very fluent in auras, which I am, yeah. uh, then just by looking at the aura, I know who the person is in detail. Got it. And I know what the issues are and how to resolve the issues because I'm not the one looking at it. Yeah. The aura is the one telling me and I'm just sitting back and taking notes, right? Yeah. So, so the different color auras yeah. are telling you whether it can be if you're emotional, like angry, confident, right. um, emotional, like uh, physical pain, mm -hmm. physical um, sensations. Or, mm -hmm. uh, so also, like see, when I'm seeing now, like I can tell, like I feel when people are connecting, it turns on when people are connecting. Mm -hmm. And then when they use their brain, I see it turn off. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I'm... You, like that old. You're, you're articulating it very correctly. And most businesses actually don't know and don't realize that they're connecting their staff, their workers, whether it's a factory or, or you know, uh, an environment that has a lot of people that need to be cohesive to arrive at a conclusion. So I think that if you step back in and, and just observe the aura in a given manufacturing facility, and if the aura is conducive and connected, uh, with everybody, then production becomes easier. Got it. And if there's an issue, then there's a break or a disconnect with the aura, and that's very easy to fix. Right. So it's it, it can be very practically presented. So auras, auras show up in different uh, environments. They're great to study. Uh, there's a practical component to them. Uh, they're fun to deal with, and it makes life easier so you know what's going on and how you should interact with that individual that you're facing. There was a, I think you said that was, you showed me a picture once of, there was a guy who took the picture of you with the camera and they were changing, you were changing the aura in the picture or something like that. There was a picture and it had. Four. Yeah. So um, an aura uh, doesn't just uh, remain static. It's ever changing. Yeah. And so uh, there's a certain color, for example, that shows up if you're physically uncomfortable. So I reached out and slapped you on your shoulder and you felt pain, it would shift into the aura and the color would show up. Or, uh, you know, some people can't see the colors, but they can feel it. So the sensation uh, would be very different. Uh, and so you can actually change the aura and it changes every nanosecond. There, it isn't static. Got it. Yeah, and it's not only ever changing in the first field, but there are several layers of fields and each one changes almost all the time because it's like when people come to me and they go okay what color is my aura and then they're expecting it to be pink blue yellow or green whatever the color is right. but the fact that it is honestly changing and merging in colors mm -hmm. um so when you see like now with your healing and auras where does the healing aspect come into this like where does the yeah. how does the healing work how does it flow um, Insofar as the auras are concerned? Yeah, like now you're seeing the aura and you see pain. So where does the healing aspect come into this? Right. So um, healing itself is, a, is an understanding of uh, how the life force flows through a body. Uh, I know those are big words and might be very confusing to your audience. <laughs> but there's a system to understand it. And if you understand that system and if you can manipulate it for the greater good, then you can monitor it. Uh, one of the ways you can monitor it is by looking at the aura field, or fields in this case. Uh, and if someone has uh, you know, an issue, whether it's a headache or a back pain, a certain color will present itself. Yeah. And if you go through a process of a particular protocol uh, that I might say to you, or uh, really any healer, whether whether they use my modality or their own modality, you can actually see their work in progress. So I use the aura in, in the field of healing as a way to monitor, not too dissimilar than, say, a physician would use, you know, a, a thermometer to test your body temperature or, or you know, get your blood pressure reading. Got it. Yeah. So, so like when now when it comes to the healing portion on the different aspects of shooting energy to those areas, mm -hmm. um, the, the function of that, so now it's the energy that you're shooting into someone mm -hmm. that is correcting the balance that's running through them. That's correct. How does that, how does that actually work? Yeah, so you've got to look at it as not you're putting it into them, but you're, you're taking, because it's 
you know, like Yoda would say, it's all around us, right? <laughs> the force. <laughs> the force. <laughs> so you, you're taking that force and you're manipulating it and directing it towards an individual that has a need. Okay. And the more you can manipulate it, the quicker whatever the issue is gets balanced back out. Got it. So it isn't a fixing or a healing, it's a balancing act. Got it. And if you can monitor what you're doing and you can control the volume of what you're putting in or putting out, if there is a deficiency or an excess, you can account for it. Okay. And so that's basically how I look at okay. healing. So, so now the area, like different areas of people's bodies. Uh -huh. So like when somebody has problems on the, the legs mm -hmm. or, and, and obviously if, if they get hit by a bus, it's a different story. Right. But, but if there's different areas and how about the different areas of the body? Uh, insofar as the healing, uh, like, yeah, like pain. So if someone has a, a chest sure. pain, or someone has an ankle pain, or I have a sure. kidney problem, or yeah, most of your listeners will will uh, recognize that there are seven or eight or nine chakras, major chakras, right? They go from the top of your body to the bottom of your body. Um, contained within those uh, portals are smaller chakras, and contained within those, they're smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're like sub chakras and yes, sub minor chakras and so on and so <laughs> forth. Right? Nobody says, "Hey, you got an issue with your sub minor <laughs> chakra," because that would be like L one six four minor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and, and it's it's good to you know look at it from a from a very simple but jovial point of view, because nothing is not balanceable. Everything is balanceable. And so, if you understand that concept, then you can identify the segment, sub-segment, as you were saying, and the, or a sub-sub-segment, and repair that, and if you repair that, everything else should begin to repair. Yeah. So, so does that, is that normally affecting, so like let's say a lower back pain mm -hmm. of being connected with um, uh, financial or um, the hunter-gatherer food, of not right. feeling like they're achieving that right. in this physical world? Yeah, you're talking about the hierarchy of needs? Yes. Yes, uh, I think there's a direct correlation with that. Uh, there's also a correlation with uh, the concept of karma, the concept of dharma. And those can also be uh, sort of understood as you're meditating. Right. And then you can bring those forth and incorporate it into whatever you're doing. And what, what is karma? Yeah, karma, um, karma to me is an act that produces a result. And that result has a, a consequence. And that consequence can either be beneficial or detrimental. Um, we understand in, in the Western world that karma is mostly detrimental. And so how do you undo that burden? Right. Uh, so you bring in another Sanskrit concept, which is called dharma, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the which brother. is the opposite <laughs> of it. Right? So you want to do more dharma and less karma. So, so dharma so is the um, uh, the creation of the problem? Is that what you would... No, dharma is actually uh, heading towards uh, undoing uh, the actions that could have caused something detrimental. Um, so, example, uh, if you uh, feed the poor, that is dharma. Got it. Right? If you ignore the poor, that could be called karma. And how it, does it impact you or the person that's, you know, not being helped by you? Right. Uh, so it's it's a very delicate balance. And these these concepts we're talking about are really very general in terms. Yes. Uh, obviously, there are deeper layers to it, but generally speaking, that's how I look at karma and, and now dharma. <laughs> so after the show, I'm going to start throwing money at everyone <laughs> just, just to stop throwing at anybody I can yeah. see. <laughs> well, then the question is: Is that karma? Yes. <laughs> they, they don't want to injure them. <laughs> So, so, um, so with with this um, the sorry, go back. So with karma. So yep. now with the karma of stuff that's going with the body, mm -hmm. uh, trying to break the karma or trying to break uh, or, or balance. Sorry, balance. Let, me, let me take the Overcoming. word. Yeah. Uh, so you're trying to. So with that, we're trying to balance what's happening to someone mm -hmm. uh, to fix something that was created to clear up. Is that correct? A hurdle or challenge, uh, a roadblock, however you want to call it, or and it doesn't have to have a medical uh, name to it. Got it. Right. So I believe that uh, those that are called doctors, whether they're doctors of the mind, like psychiatrist or 
uh, doctors like in surgery. Uh, I think they are part of a team that plays with uh, the individual's health and recovery. Along with them, it might be a priest person, might be a best friend, might be someone like us, mm -hmm. and then all else fails. Hey, take meditation, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a complete package. <laughs> it's interesting that they say that um, yeah. even for people with psoriasis, yes. say meditation is the cure for psoriasis. It could be. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so as you're practicing this on, on people and you have a lot of people who come to you and you have a lot of people learning, when they're coming to learn and to turn on abilities, so do you believe that everybody has the abilities? Do you believe that... Uh, some people don't want to know that they have abilities. What, what do you see when you're, when you're going through this? Because some people, it's very, they don't want to connect yeah. with it at all. Like they don't want to know, don't tell me. I, I, I don't right. want to know. Right. Um, there are basically three categories of people uh, and you've defined them. Uh, one that just don't care, one that kind of want to know a little bit and one that really want to know a lot. Yeah. And the category of I want to know a lot is very few in numbers. The category that says I don't care to know is equally half of what remains. And the category that kind of wants to know but really doesn't want to know is the other half of the remainder. Okay. And um, I think that most, if not all, people have the talent. And like, like in anything, you know, you're, you're better at something than the next person. So there's a, there's a leveling or a layering of talent. And uh, most of us, I think, have it. And, and you, you know, we've incorporated into the, to the language, like walk down a dark alley in the middle of the night and the hair on your back, what does that mean? Yeah. You're sensing something, right? Yeah. Whether it's good or bad, but you're sensing something. Uh, so I think there, it's, a, it's an understood concept, um, but it isn't practiced. And there are ways to teach people in a very practical way how to take some of that and learn how to deal with it so that your life gets better, whether you're in the I don't want to know category or I kind of want to know category. Yeah. Right? And so if we could do that, then the world would be better. <coughs> and so if, if I say to you, I really dislike you, but my aura is saying I'm confused, yeah. then what am I saying? Am I saying I'm confused or am I saying I don't like you? Yeah. I might not like the conversation we're having, but I'm still going to be confused. Cool. So if you could perceive that, you could then say, is it me you don't like, or are you just confused about a concept? Can, can we talk about that? Yeah. And when you have that brought into the discussion, then maybe things change. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, like, I, I remember we were at the, uh, the dinner at Christmas, and yes. I had a pain in my, <coughs> yes. in my rib, and you, you didn't tell me, you just come and touch me to take away my pain, <laughs> and I know he was, hey, he's, he's being put by you, he was doing <laughs> So So with that, like, when you're, when you're doing that, Mm -hmm. Is there a sense of reward that comes out of this? Because there's obviously the, the reason why you do it, and there's a love that you're trying to give to everybody, yeah. um, which is beyond uh, uh, just the, the, the normal basic. It's, it's really like you're, you're helping everybody who comes through your yeah. door. So my philosophy <coughs> is, A, if we're at a party, let's have fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're out of sorts, <laughs> let's uh, balance you out <laughs> so that you can really have fun. Um, but uh, I mostly do that with my students. Uh, and people in my uh, friends category. And if I see something off, then I'll balance it. Uh, but if, if, if it's a stranger, I just observe. Okay. I, don't, I don't do that. But the, the, I, I think what you're getting at here is uh, that, and, we've, and we discussed this, I'm already perceiving there's something off with you. Yeah. Right? And uh, I'm localizing it. And whatever tools I'm using, and we talked about auras, yeah. you localize it, and you go in and you address it, and you repair it. And sometimes it takes a short time, sometimes it takes a longer time, yeah. and it's done. And what about like with harder cases? So obviously there's people with a lot more going on, which requires a lot more energy. And the physical toll that it takes on you, uh, how does yeah. that play a part? Like obviously people think that something goes wrong because when people are doing it themselves right. and they absorb the problems or have other problems that the p person who is holding those problems yeah. have? Great question. Uh, I think it's best illustrated uh, by talking about, uh, let's, let's use Lyme um, as an issue. So uh, when Lyme, when you're bitten by a tick and you have Lyme deposited in your body, 
uh, the Lyme by itself produces certain outcomes in the body. Uh, and then because it's in the body and it's doing what it's doing to the body, there are secondary and tertiary issues that show up yeah. that may not be Lyme related, but they're there and they're now more pronounced. And so uh, for someone that has Lyme, and we do a lot of Lyme, uh, you, uh, you can actually identify the different layers. And once you have them identified, you go and do the basic treatment and you focus in on if it's Lyme that's going to be the first level of, uh, of attendance, then you deal with that. And then you go back in and you look at the secondary and the tertiary issues. Um, uh, it's interesting how the body can sort of reject that it, it has an issue yeah. and the person. Uh, so the other aspect of fixing a person, and again, we're talking about Lyme, is that, hey, I don't have Lyme. And if I have Lyme, then I must be weak. Yeah. Or I did something stupid, or I, you know, some other factor comes into play. But Lyme is very easy to uh, deal with. It just takes a little bit of effort to attend to it. Uh, and, and when people take on that problem, mm -hmm. uh, w where does that come from, of people taking on other people's uh, trying to balance people, and now they're having symptoms themselves and struggling to clear symptoms. Mm -hmm. So wh why does that happen with certain people? Because yeah. you can have a healer who's all of a sudden got themselves in trouble because they, <laughs> they can't clear, <laughs> they, they clear can't themselves. Play. Yeah. Um, we're looking at uh, a component of empathy or an empath. Uh, that's how I'm describing it, and I'm very open to being incorrect uh, with my descriptions. But my experience has shown me uh, over the years that uh, when someone has an understanding of someone else, uh, that person's called an empath. Yeah. And there might be other ways to define it, but I'm looking at it from a practical point of view. So uh, the empath does actually extend him or herself to the other individual and take on their, their weight. Yeah. Uh, the key is how do you get rid of that? And there are various ways to do that. There are some very simple ways to do that. We talked about yeah. one, which is meditation. Yes. Uh, and then beyond that, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And so you either need guidance or you need an expert to do it for you. Yeah. Right. So, or, and what I mean by expert is someone who's fluent in it, yes. that is practiced in it. Uh, doesn't have to have a degree in it, but, <laughs> you know, understands how the whole thing can be put together again. <laughs> and, and, you know, like I know you used to wear copper. Yeah. So where, where does copper play a part in that? Yeah, copper, uh, again, it's a very practical uh, part of life. Yeah. So copper is a very good tool that can attract, and, and you have... And here's my copper that I always have in my pocket. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> copper is a good conductor of both just um, um, electricity, uh, so it can ground, that, that means just to take the excessive off of a house so it the circuits in the house don't get overburdened or when lightning strikes I guess it goes yeah. to that uh, aspect of the house where there's the copper grounding I think the same holds true for physical bodies that sometimes we just get overwhelmed and if we don't know how to take care of it then a, then a trinket like what you've got there really helps yes. I mean really really and, helps. and it heats up it does heat up. So all of a sudden you say, like, is it heating up or is it my skin? And then you say, is it my skin? Then I'm going like this, just trying yes. to feel this thing. If it's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if it does heat up, of course, it means it's, it's grounding you. It's yeah. taking away uh, the excess that you don't need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now you also do, um, like, clearing of room, like I energy do. in a room. Uh -huh. And I know that the modality takes where not only is it the person, but it's actually the physical space that has... Um, uh, and, and, and an impact? Yes, an impact on, on the person. Yeah. How, how, how does that play a part of this? Yeah, so um, uh, it, it, it can be best described from a scientific point of view when scientists do experiments, they like to have a clean lab. Yeah. Uh, and if the lab is contaminated, then the results will be contaminated. No difference with energy, uh, because if there is uh, an energy that just is... Uh, present that has nothing to do with what you're doing and that can uh, impact or influence what you're doing and so part of what we do is we then clear the space and uh, the technique is sometimes more intricate and most of the time it's simple yeah. and for those of us that are fluent in it it's really simple yeah. right 
But what it does is it's it's uh, similar to sweeping your floor when there's broken glass, so you don't step on the glass. Got it. Right? And so you can just run about the room and do what you need to do. But if there's broken glass, you're going to have to tiptoe or wear you know thick slippers or shoes or flip flops or something yeah. so you don't get cut up. <laughs> Same concept, and uh, that emanates that that energy can emanate from just uh, the geographical location of a of a building right? you know sometimes when you're when you're do when you're about to work on someone and you have something inside you that says don't work on this person mm -hmm. stay away from this person and some you but you really feel like you want to help because now physically you want to help but mm -hmm. is there any repercussion from that because you're trying to help when you feel like you shouldn't help yeah no repercussion fortunately and there's some people that can be helped should be helped uh, and some people that should not be helped uh, and again, it goes back down to whatever their life journey is. And we can have a good discussion about karma, dharma with that too. <laughs> uh, but basically, it's a, it's a signal. Either you do it or you don't. And you're given the instructions ahead of doing it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that comes through meditation. So that comes from meditation. There's, a, there's a flow. <laughs> so with what you see on people in the world today, mm -hmm. and you see that things that affect them that are uh, exterior, mm -hmm. it's, it's the exterior part that's mm -hmm. affecting them off. I must have a million to make me feel happy. Right. I must have the blue Ferrari to make me feel right. happy. Um, that obviously plays a part in, in their bodies. Like with people that you're seeing, mm -hmm. is there anything that you feel like people should be uh, cognizant of in their daily lives? Yeah. Um, so you're talking about materialism. Yes. And in my line of work, uh, what I call my line of work, is one can dissect oneself into three or four different parts. And one is the, you know, the physical tactile body. Yes. Uh, uh, the other body is the emotional body. And, and you, what you're referring to is the impact uh, present in the emotional body. So, you know, uh, if you have a million dollars and I have a million one, does that make me superior? Yes. That marginal incremental one dollar? Uh, no, it doesn't. I could have si simply the one dollar and I could be superior because of my attitude, emotion, uh, with that amount in my hand or not, yeah. right? And does it make a difference if it's a blue Ferrari or red Ferrari or even a Ferrari? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think uh, we're being shown, a, a, at least in today's world, that the Ferrari may not matter because, like you know, it's COVID restrictions and yeah. you're a lockdown and no one's driving. Sorry. Just keep polishing it in the garage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so it becomes an item that you have to pay insurance on, yes. and it sits there, it collects dust. Now it emotionally disturbs you because it's not being <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, in, in a different way. Um, so I think that it's the emotional body that you're talking about. Okay. And, and uh, the direction that we're going, I think it's more positive, and I think we're leaving those kinds of thoughts behind yeah. and reaching for other thoughts. So that's where you feel like the, the energy on the world is shifting. Yes. And, and do you feel like it's picked up recently more than normal? I believe so. I, uh, I think it, uh, the start of it occurred many years ago uh, where you had, uh, and, and we see that today very, very openly, where you have investment vehicles, whether they're from the Wall Street part of the, of the world or just people that want to uh, support via charities. Um, they're looking for conscious businesses. Right? So... Uh, we're looking at uh, businesses that can be sustainable uh, biz by themselves, businesses that don't destroy the environment, uh, businesses that can help everyone within it, yeah. uh, within its periphery and sphere, as opposed to just one or two or three or four individuals. And we're not looking at bottom lines anymore. Right? So, so I've seen that occur because uh, I, I do business consulting too. I've seen that occur back in the late 1980s that yeah. began already to present itself. So people would be very cautious about, you know, do you, do you build a building with the nth square footage, which would be counter to the environment that it's in, or do you create a, a space that is in harmony with its environment? Right. So people are heading that direction. Yeah. More, more quickly in, in the last uh, several years than, than not. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, there's, 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 I, don't, I mean, I know we've spoken about this, but there was a time where uh, obviously my wife was sick, mm-hmm. and um, I would ha- I would carry her around. Literally, she couldn't lift herself. Mm-hmm. And then I, I would call you and you would send energy. Mm-hmm. And she was literally walking up and the stairs by herself mm-hmm. and fixing the beds and doing stuff. And it was trying to sustain, obviously her body was very um, uh, weak and frail at that time. Mm-hmm. But it, it, seeing the energy, and that really was what a, tr- a big trigger for me of mm-hmm. seeing something miraculous happen, which I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. And, and just seeing uh, just, just how she would be able to carry herself. And she would go up the stairs and normally it's me carrying her up yeah. the stairs. Yeah. So it, it was really magical seeing that, and um, and that was that's where our, our, our friendship began. Right. Um, and yeah, it's I remember the banana. Yeah. And in my living room that she ate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So there's there's a lot of research being done by scientists that that is beginning to prove uh, what we're doing. There there are scientists that are doing uh, research with sound healing. Um, that is emanating a frequency uh, in megahertz. Uh, there are scientists that are, that are understanding what is called the power of prayer yeah. uh, and what is long distance healing. And so there are a lot of books that are coming out by well-known, well-respected researchers uh, and those that have a reputation that this stuff is beginning to come into place. Yeah. And and hopefully sooner rather than later it'll be a, a mainstream component. Yeah, so that's so that's like the shift from going to your normal doctor mm-hmm. to now holistic, and yeah. uh, it's it's starting to change. So the it world is starting where people are starting to explore this. Yes, uh, uh, good examples will be uh, major institutions like the Cleveland Clinic now have an Oriental medicine component within their makeup. Interesting. Right. So why have that? Because you know, a bunch of herbs. They're incorporating it into their practice. Well, Nand, I want to yeah. thank you for sharing with us, yeah. and I appreciate you coming out and um, yeah, lots of concepts. Thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for dragging it out. I <laughs> uh, enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Nand. Thank you. Still do this photo show. Hey.